Okay, I call the or call to order this meeting of the Oversight Committee. It is approximately 8.01 a.m. El Paso time, 9.01 Central time. We are holding this meeting by video conference via Zoom due to continued COVID-19 precautions. Because we before we start the agenda, I want to go over a few technical points. If you are not speaking, make sure that your microphone is on mute. Please leave your camera on for the entire meeting so that we can see that we have a quorum. If you disconnect from the meeting and cannot reconnect, contact Michael Fisher or Terry Simeon for help rejoining in the meeting. Moving on to roll call. Dr. Cummings, are you able to do roll call? Yes. All right, Mr. Margo. Here. Dr. Hernandez. Here. Mr. Montgomery. Here, here, here. Dr. Patel. Ms. Payne. Here. Dr. Rice. Here. Dr. Rosenfeld. I'm here. All right, we have a quorum. Okay, members, the draft minutes from the November 18th Mike. Oversight Committee is available in your agenda packet behind tab one. Are there any corrections to the minutes as circulated? Hearing none, the chair will entertain a motion to approve the minutes of the November 18 Oversight Committee meeting. So moved. Move. Second. All in favor, vote aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Our next agenda item is public comment. Public feedback is critically important because Texans created secret. Opening our meetings with public comment underscores this board's commitment to transparency and accountability. Ms. Doyle, has secret received any request to provide public comment? We have not, sir. Okay. We have invited two secret grantees to make presentations to the Oversight Committee about the work they are doing. Dr. Abby Berenson is first up. She is a multiple prevention and ac academic research secret grantee at UTMB. Following Dr. Berenson is Dr. Michael Curran and James Barlow will update us on work that secret is supporting at immunogenesis. Mrs. Maggot, will you, will you introduce Dr. Berenson? I will. Good morning, everyone. It's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Abby Berenson. She's the founding director of UTMB's Center for Interdisciplinary Research in Women's Health. UTMB honored her in 2012 with an endowed faculty position, the Ruth Hargraves Chair in OBGYN. During her career at UTMB, she has mentored over 30 assistant professors and postdoctoral fellows, as well as numerous medical students. She leads an NIH-funded research career development program for assistant professors who investigate a broad array of topics in women's health, and is, it's now in its 16th year. Dr. Berenson is recognized as an expert in women's health and has served on numerous review and policy panels for the CDC, FDA, and NIH. She has published over 200 papers in peer-reviewed journals and maintained extramural funding since 1994. Currently, her work focuses on cancer prevention. Dr. Berenson has received nine HPV-related secret awards, eight prevention, and one academic research individual investigator award for prevention and early detection. Five of the nine awards are currently active. She now serves on both um, of CPRIT's Prevention Advisory Committee and the University Advisory Committee. Please welcome Dr. Berenson. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. I would like to thank the Oversight Committee for the opportunity today to tell you about the work that we've been doing at increasing HPV vaccination rates among the low income patients at UTMB. It has been a great pleasure and honor to do this work. Human papillomavirus is known to be responsible for six different kinds of cancer, five which affect women and three which affect men. At this time, there are over 40,000 new cases of HPV-related cancers diagnosed in the U.S. every year. 
In 2006, so almost 15 years since it was approved by the FDA, the HPV vaccine was introduced and was felt to be a real game changer. People talked about the potential it had to markedly reduce these six kinds of cancer or even eliminate some of them. The FDA and the CDC tells us that we need to give two to three doses to our patients over a six to 12 month time period, according to the age of the patient. But they prefer that it be given to adolescents at 11 to 12 years of age. For those who do not receive it at the recommended time, catch up vaccination is allowed up until age 45 now, which was extended from age 26. The CDC has also told us that we need to vaccinate 80% of girls and boys in the United States completely to eliminate the types in the four valent vaccine if we want to achieve herd immunity. But the numbers from 2018, the latest year for which we have data available, clearly indicate that we are nowhere near 80% for all doses completed. Here you see 13 to 17 year olds are 51% and 18 to 26 year olds who are no longer eligible for the vaccine for children's programs are at a dismal 21%. When we looked at the electronic medical records and surveyed UTMB's low income patients, we found that their baseline rates were even lower than this. So in 2012, I began to look at ways that we could intervene to increase our HPV vaccination rates among our patients. And when I looked at the literature, I saw that most reported interventions for vaccine uptake had very poor success rate. Those that did seem to work were multi-component interventions, especially if they included patient navigators, provider education, and patient reminders. So we designed an evidence-based intervention that included multiple components that had been shown to be successful. The patient navigation component we felt was important because this would allow the patients to get accurate information about the vaccine and dispel any myths that they might have about its lack of efficacy or safety concerns. We also felt patients needed help remembering their appointments and rescheduling missed appointments. Provider education we knew was important because that is the number one reason that patients agree to get the HPV vaccine because their provider recommended it. So we felt we needed to increase the number of providers who routinely recommended vaccination to their eligible patients and talk to them about the best ways to do this. We also felt that it was critical to add more vaccination sites. Our patients were telling us that it was difficult for them to find vaccination sites in certain areas, or if they showed up to the clinic and requested it, they could not get it that same day. And finally, we found that financial assistance had been demonstrated in the literature to be very important. This is one of the critical roles that CIPRA plays in increasing HPV vaccination rates. It is a very expensive vaccine and many of our patients just simply could not afford to get it if there was not funding available through CIPRA. Over the last eight and a half years, we have implemented HPV vaccination programs in four different sites. And I'm gonna go through these with you one by one to give you more details. It was possible for us to do this due to the robust infrastructure UTMB has of clinics located across Southeast and South Texas. These extend almost to the Louisiana border on the east side and south down to McAllen near the US-Mexico border. Patients come to these clinics from a large number of counties, over 30 counties. The area served encompasses 11 Senate and 29 House districts of the Texas legislature. UTMB serves patients from three different races, ethnicities, Hispanic, white, and black, 
for the majority of their patients. And if you look at these numbers, you'll see on our postpartum unit and in the Rio Grande Valley, we have large representation from Hispanic patients. One thing that most of these patients have in common in our clinics is a very low family income. When we surveyed patients, we found that over 75% had a total family income under $30,000 per year. Our records indicate that only 15% have private insurance, which is the main source of payment for HPV vaccinations for most patients. So they did not have this source. So the CIPRT funding allowed us to offer the vaccine at no cost to these patients who could not otherwise afford it. The first intervention I wanted to tell you about is our postpartum vaccination program, which we implemented in 2012. We selected this as our first site because it was familiar to us. Women have been given the rubella vaccine for decades postpartum while they are still in the hospital. Therefore, our physicians and our nurses were used to vaccinating women postpartum. We also knew that because women stay in the hospital for one or more days after their delivery, there would be ample time for the patient navigators to counsel the patients about the vaccine and allow them to decide if they wanted to get vaccinated. Finally, we knew that women are very well connected with the healthcare system in the early months following a delivery. So we could coordinate these essential follow-up doses with their postpartum visits or even with their newborn checkups, which our pediatric colleagues helped us arrange. So in 2012, we implemented this first program, which was limited to women from just Galveston County who were less than or equal to 26 years of age. It really went very well from day one. During this cycle, we exceeded our expectations and 1,204 women received their first dose while they were on the postpartum unit in the hospital before they were discharged. Overall, we administered 35-31 doses and our initiation rate, which had been abysmally low at 25%, went to 81% amongst postpartum women. Our completion rate was extremely high at 94% for completing all three doses because these women came back and got their follow-up doses with their postpartum checks and their newborn visits. 563 professionals were attended an HPV lecture and learned how to counsel patients about the need to be vaccinated. In cycle two, we decided to not do a baby step, but instead to do a giant leap and go from one to 29 counties. We decided to serve all patients that delivered a baby at UTMB in the recommended age range at that time. And this included five medically underserved areas and 17 MUA and rural counties. So these are typically hard to reach patients but they do come in when they have a baby. So that gave us a great opportunity. This program also exceeded our expectations with 2284 women receiving a first dose on the unit and being able to administer 64, 27 doses during the project period. Our completion rate remained high at 86%, even though many women had to travel a distance to get their follow-up shots due to the much wider catchment area we were using during this program. We educated 722 professionals during this cycle and we're very excited when after years of work, we're able to implement standing orders as part of our postpartum order set for HPV vaccination for all eligible patients. Now this has been important because when the patient signs a consent that she wants the HPV vaccine, previously her physician had to be contacted who had finished rounds and be asked to stop what they were doing at that time and go and put an order for the vaccine in the medical record. 
Sometimes this resulted in patients leaving the hospital without being vaccinated. Now, the patient navigator can inform the nurse that the patient wants the vaccine and the nurse can give the vaccine without waiting for the physician to individually order each dose. One of the things that we do with all of our projects is qualitative interviews on providers and or patients. So this is an example of a qualitative interview from a nurse that worked on the postpartum unit. And you'll see the type of valuable information it gives us. She said, in the beginning, it was like, golly, we got to give another shot. We just got something extra to do. And that really is how a lot of people feel when you try to go in and implement a new program in a clinical setting. You have indeed increased the workload. So you have to sell them on the importance of doing this for the patients. And indeed that did happen because she went on to say in this quote, we have been doing it for a couple of years now. It is in our routine. So just persistence over time, the staff will accept the need to add these additional services to what they are doing. We just began cycle three of our postpartum intervention and we're very excited about this new cycle. We were able to increase eligibility to those less than or equal to 45 years of age because that is now part of the FDA approval. But in addition, we have extended the program to the Rio Grande Valley and we're working with UTRGV's resident clinic that cares for patients who have no form of insurance. They have been very enthusiastic and we love working with them. All personnel meet remotely, virtually, um, every month. We started working with the chair when we were writing the grant of the OBGYN department. He is now involved one of the junior faculty, Dr. Denise De Los Santos, who's doing a great job, has lots of enthusiasm. She has involved one of her OBGYN residents. They have also gotten involved one of their medical students. And most recently, they had a nurse from UTRGV come and ask if she can be the patient navigator on this program. So it is already taking off, even though we're just at the stage of collecting some more baseline data from this area. The second site where we did an intervention was our pediatric and adolescent clinics because the CDC says we need to vaccinate people at 11 to 12 years of age. In our clinics, we found that the generalists were vaccinating patients at 11 to 12, but subspecialists did not do it routinely. That is because it is thought that patients that see a subspecialist, like a diabetic, who is seeing an endocrinologist would have a primary care provider. But the truth is many times these patients do not have a separate primary care provider. And since this vaccine is not required for school in Texas, they weren't getting vaccinated. So we found the baseline rates were very low in these clinics. We knew that they would need on-site patient navigators to help with the counseling and addressing questions because we were going to be markedly increasing the number of patients vaccinated in these clinics. And we also needed to hire a nurse to help with giving all the vaccinations. Finally, we found that we had to work with the vaccines for children because suddenly we were requesting a great many more doses from them than we had previously. So we had to provide very broad based education before this program could be successful. We had to educate the subspecialists that they needed to put an order for the vaccine in the medical record after the patient navigator counseled and consented the patients. We had to educate the clinic stop that they had to check the vaccine stop frequently and make sure that it was in stock, the clinic staff because we were running out. We had to talk to the staff and the parents of the need to make sure the child that was in the clinic got vaccinated the same day. Because in the past, the patients were being rescheduled for a different day 
and that could result in a missed opportunity. We also wanted to make a follow-up appointment before the family left the clinic so they knew exactly when to come back. And if the patient needed two more shots, they would get two appointments before they left the clinic. And we talked to the family about whether there were other children that needed to be vaccinated and how they could make an appointment for them. In cycle one of our PD Adolescent Project, we started with two counties, Galveston and Brazoria, and our initiation rate we found was a very low 36% initially. It went up to 67% during this cycle, surpassing records from Texas and the US at that time. We vaccinated about 1,300 females and about 1,300 males at a time when many males were not getting the vaccine yet because parents were not aware that it was indicated for boys and delivered over 5,700 doses. Our completion rate for this type of project of 93% is extremely high and really not reported in the literature before this. As you remember from the earlier slides I showed you, completion rates were about 50% in 2018 in the United States. So this is way above that. 452 professionals attended a lecture and this time 101 parents participated in post-project interview. And these are just some quotes from a couple of the parents. One of them told us, when I went in after the first appointment, they made, managed to make the next appointment for me so that I wouldn't forget. So they made it easy for me. So that was one of our goals, to make sure that it was easy as possible for the parents. And another parent said, now we get texts reminding us, so that's really a good idea, whoever came up with that. So at the time we started this, text messaging for follow-up appointments really wasn't routine. Now UTMB does this for all types of appointments. We are now in cycle two of our PD Adolescent Project. And again, we did a leap and went from two to 23 counties. So far, we have vaccinated over 2,000 boys and girls and delivered over 4,000 doses. We have educated 522 professionals and we are still going on this project. We were delighted when the Vaccines for Children program recognized that we were the top place in Galveston County for giving out HPV vaccines out of 29 clinics. And they gave us a rating of excellent. The third place where we did an intervention was East Texas. Why East Texas? If you look at cervical cancer rates in Texas, you will see that they are higher in East Texas than the rest of the state. But that is also an area that has a significant part of the population opposed to vaccinations. So that can be a bad combination. When we looked at our UTMB patients that used two clinics in that area, we found out that the baseline HPV vaccination rates for just one dose were only 14%, so much lower than the rest of Texas and the US. We knew an intervention needed to be done in this area after we got this data. During cycle one, we were able to increase our initiation rate to 60% and our completion rate to 70%, in spite of the fact that there were many people opposed to vaccinations that came to our clinics. We administered over 4,000 doses to males and females and educated 383 professionals. We also did interviews on 50 patients who expressed satisfaction with the program. We just began cycle two of our East Texas project. And in fact, this was funded just a couple of weeks before the stay at home orders were issued. 
We had already planned to go from two to 13 counties and we continued with that plan, but we had to make some adjustments because when the stay at home orders were issued, the clinics went to telehealth. So people were not coming in to get the vaccines. During this period, the patient navigators figured out that they could talk to patients that were getting these telehealth visits and counsel them about the vaccine. If the patients were interested, they could then get permission to contact them once the clinic was back to full services. So using that technique, they were able to contact a number of patients when the stay at home orders were lifted and bring them in for their vaccines. In the first nine months of this program, we have vaccinated 525 women, delivered 872 doses, and educated 158 professionals by virtual learning techniques. So we are on target, even though we are dealing with the pandemic. And the final place where we have implemented an intervention program is in the Rio Grande Valley in McAllen, Texas. When we looked at our clinic in McAllen, Texas, we were surprised to find that they did not have a refrigerator to store the HPV vaccine, so they did not stock it. Therefore, it was not surprising when we looked at the electronic medical records and talked to the patients to find that very few of our patients had initiated the vaccine at all. We are in cycle one of this project and the first thing we did was purchase a refrigerator and made sure that the vaccine was kept in stock at all times. Since we started this project, we have vaccinated 1,149 women, administered almost 2,600 doses and educated 473 professionals. One of the areas about which we are very passionate is disseminating what we are doing to others because we feel that by doing that, it will encourage people in other universities, in other hospitals, in other clinics across Texas and across the United States to start HPV vaccination programs. And we have found that we've presented at 23 meetings, done 12 invited lectures, and I'm frequently approached and asked how they can get this going in their local area. So that's been very exciting. We've also tried to educate the medical community through nine peer reviewed publications. And this is a list of all of our publications. We just most recently had one published talking about our postpartum program and how it can be successful when you have patients from a large catchment area. So we've learned a lot of lessons from these projects I would like to share with you. First, I will tell you that implementing new interventions in a healthcare setting is very difficult and time consuming. You have to plan carefully, you have to keep communication going two ways at all times, and you have to be willing to dig your heels in and do the hard work. It requires a great team approach. It is adding work, and it's making people change what they are doing. So you will get pushed back, but people will buy in because they care about the patients and they care that we protect our patients. We have found that separate funding has been so critical because that allows us to provide support to the clinics and the hospital personnel, the providers and the patients. Largely, this is done through the patient navigators by taking on the counseling so the providers aren't being asked to do that one-on-one -on -one with every patient and they're freed up to answer the difficult questions. We feel that broad-based provider education is very important for sustainability because the providers are the ones that the patients ultimately look toward to see whether or not they should be vaccinated. So they need to buy in as well. And the external funding for the vaccines has really made a difference. Just as you're seeing with the COVID vaccination right now, where people don't have to worry whether or not they can afford that vaccine. People on these SIPR projects do not have to worry about whether or not they can afford the HPV vaccine. 
We do check to see if they are eligible for federal and state programs like vaccines for children. And the vaccines are charged to those programs if they are not, if they are eligible. However, if they are not eligible, they can still be vaccinated using separate funds. We did not anticipate it when we started this work, but the prevention projects actually led to an important research question. The patient navigators noticed how many phone calls and rescheduling patients needed to complete all three doses and that it became much easier when they only had to do two doses for patients that initiated at less than 15 years of age as required by the CDC. However, there are no randomized controlled trials looking at the efficacy of two doses among boys and girls over 14 years of age. So there are no guidelines to use only two doses in the, that population. So we applied for and obtained funding to do a study examining the immune response after two versus three doses among males and females over 14 years of age. We began the recruitment for this study in 2019. We did have to stop recruitment for just a two month period during the stay at home orders in 2020, but we did not have to stop following people that were already in the study. Our university allowed us to do that so we could minimize loss to follow up. Once the stay at home orders were lifted, we we're allowed to go ahead and recruit again. And now we've already recruited over 350 males and females in this study. So in conclusion, I would like to thank CIPRIT for their generosity and support in doing this work. I actually um, changed my career to do cancer prevention once I was funded with my first grant from CIPRIT because I recognized what good I could do the patients and the team was so enthusiastic and happy about doing this work. It has been incredibly rewarding. Um, I'd also like to thank the UTMB hospitals and clinics for taking on the additional work and bringing these vaccination rates up much higher among our patients and our pediatric clinics. We are now focusing on the low, lower end of the age spectrum because we have found that our teenagers have mostly been vaccinated in a prior project. And I want to thank the patient navigators, the research nurses, the managers, the collaborators, and so many others who work hard every day to make these projects successful. So this, I'm going to leave you this on this cold winter morning of a sunrise in Galveston, and it's really beautiful on a nice 70 to 80 degree day. I hope you can visit us. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Berenson. Members, are there questions for Dr. Berenson? I have a question. Go ahead. Uh, I was just wondering um, if you could project, if it's possible to project how many cancers you prevented uh, by your therapy. I think that would be very difficult because you'd have to add up the all six types. I know we've given well over 20,000 doses at this point, and um, I would have to do a number of calculations to get back to you on that. Do you, you think it's a significant number? I think that when you consider not only the cancers, but the precancers, it's a very high number. Because Thank you. one in five women have to undergo leaps for, and biopsies and be followed for dysplasia. So I count those in there too. In I would too. So that makes it a very high number. Excellent, thank you. Are there other questions? Just a quick question, uh, Dee, just to let you know, I'm, I've joined the meeting. I see you. <laughs> uh, my question Thanks, is man. that in East Texas, there was some degree of opposition. What was that opposition or worries or concerns? Um, we don't know where that stems from, whether it's social media or whether it's coming from within the healthcare providers, but patients will come into the clinic and tell you that they've done their own research and that they do not feel the vaccine is safe. 
Thank you. I have a question. Go ahead, Ambrosio. Yes, uh, thank you for the wonderful presentation. You're right, in, in accordance with the vaccine um, administration, I mean, even with COVID-19, we're, we're hearing that from the public. They're, they self-educate and for whatever reason, they're trying or don't want to do it. But uh, great presentation. Uh, thank you for your, and UTMB as well. Thank you for your research and your intervention in Texas. Um, did you ever consider as a partnership to work with any of the school districts? Because they vaccinate, they have nurses, and the, like and just in the Rio Grande Valley, we have like 49 school districts where they're public and private. I just wonder, did you guys ever consider using that infrastructure? Yes, excellent question. Actually, we had plans to go into four different school districts in our pediatric project starting in uh, when the pandemic happened. Okay. And so okay. that has been put on hold temporarily because of what's going on in the schools. We want to give them the space that they need to just try to get their schools going. And then we do plan to go back to the schools, yes. Right, and, and then the other thing for, because uh, I'm a, a pediatrics specialist, and I can tell you, I can't see a single child in my clinic without a referral. So either they're under managed Medicaid or private insurance. But the health plans, I don't know if you know this, but uh, they provide incentives for all primaries, not for specialists, but only primaries. That like the ACOs for adults. So they're incentivized to make sure everybody gets vaccinated for whatever metrics they need. I would urge you to talk to the managed Medicare, Medicaid health plans that are essentially funded to the state of Texas, either through our legislators or directly. And maybe they can help you push your uh, program because if it comes from them, incentivizing the family care doctors or the primarily OBs as part of their quality metrics, they're more likely to do it. So they can do your heavy lifting for you. They mandate as part of their quality metrics. Just something to consider. Excellent, excellent suggestion. Thank you very much. I have a question re related to HPV, the vaccination. My recollection is uh, Governor Perry tried to mandate that and then there was great political pushback. Has there been any more mo movement to uh, try to mandate uh, HPV as a part of your uh, vaccination requirements for schools? for school-aged children? There has not been in Texas. There have been in a couple other states, and actually it has not gone extremely well. It's similar to here where they would mandate it and then they would pull back. So I only think there's maybe one or two states in the whole country now that has it mandated for school. Well, is, do you think that there's more research that's required to make it justifiable for, for the uh, legislature to pass that? Uh, perhaps. I think what happened with HPV is it is a sexually transmitted infection and it has uh, suffered from that type of publicity, if you want to say that, where parents feel that vaccinating their child against a sexually transmitted infection at 11 to 12 might send a signal that, that it is okay for the child to have sex. Now, I don't, that's been proven not to be true. There is research on that, but that is still a concern of the parents and the parents um, for that reason want to be present when the child is vaccinated. And of course, at the schools, they're not present. In terms of uh, mandating it for schools, a lot of parents just don't want that particular vaccine. They say that the child is older. Yeah, maybe once we get through all this the COVID vaccines and the acceptance once and for all, we can readdress this. Ramona, are we uh, replicating any of this throughout the uh, um, state with any of our prevention uh, grants? There are other projects that um, like HPV in school districts. And um, I think Abby started with uh, UTMB because it's a closed system and it's much easier um, for acceptance among the administration and all the providers. Um, but certainly I think people are, uh, other grantees are aware of her success and we're always encouraging people to um, look into other grantees programs and encourage grantees to apply for dissemination grants so that they will have the tools able to um, 
uh, start the programs in their own areas. Okay, so we're spreading the word about the successes here. Okay. Absolutely. All right, any other questions for Dr. Berenson? Thank you, that was a great presentation. We really appreciate it. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, Dr. Walker Peach, will you introduce Dr. Curran and Mr. Barlow? Absolutely. Um, it's a real pleasure to have the principals for immunogenesis joining us today. They are um, a Texco awardee, $15.5 million. And we've got both the principals here, both the scientific founder and the business uh, principal as well joining us. Uh, Dr. Curran is the scientific founder of, the, of immunogenesis. He's also the head of the SAB, the scientific advisory board for the company. He is also an associate professor at immunology at um, MD Anderson in Houston, Texas, where his lab focuses on extending uh, the efficacy of, immun of uh, immunotherapy into those solid tumors that are right now considered cold. And he'll tell you a lot more about that conversion from cold to hot uh, tumor types. Um, he is a pioneer in modern um, immuno-oncology. Um, he's, he is uh, the first to describe and drove the early development of the combination approach of, of PD-1, CTL, I mean, CTLA-4. Um, that's still the most effective type of immunotherapy for solid tumors on the market. He is joined by his partner in crime, uh, Mr. Jim Barlow, who is the CEO of Immunogenesis. Uh, Jim has extensive experience in driving oncology um, commercial strategy across a number of biopharmas in our area. Uh, he spent eight years at Merck, where he was in various leadership, leadership positions for, for the um, oncology commercial franchise at Merck before joining BMS, Bristol Myers Squibb, in uh, 2012, where he was uh, jumping into immune oncology at the very beginning of, of these discoveries. And, and uh, he was part of the commercial team that developed and launched uh, Ipi Immulum Lab and uh, Nivolumab. Both of these products um, were uh, um, discovered by a team that involved Dr. Curran as well. And you'll probably know these products by their branded names of Optivo and Ervoy. So with that, thank you um, for joining us today. I will hand it now to, to Dr. Curran. Uh, thank you for joining. Thanks so much, uh, Cindy, for the very kind introduction. Can you guys hear me okay? So I live in Houston, um, and my uh, house has no power and no water. And so I got a hotel to do this, and the hotel lost power. So I am uh, in my car parked outside of McDonald's right now, <laughs> stealing their free Wi-Fi. So, so, uh, so if I disappear, you will find that... Uh, our CEO, Jim Barlow, is actually a very scientifically astute individual also uh, beyond his business acumen. So without further ado, let, let, me, let me move forward. Uh, first off, thank you, Seaprit, for giving us this opportunity both to continue this work and to present it to you uh, today. I'm Mike Curran. Uh, we should move forward. Uh, I think Jim's going to run the slides just in case I disappear um, or get a hankering for an egg muffin, either way. Uh, so... Immunotherapy uh, has taken many forms as it really continues to establish itself as a pillar of clinical oncology. But the form we're going to talk about today is, you know, what's really made immunotherapy um, a key pillar of immuno-oncology, which is T-cell checkpoint modulation. You can go ahead and click, Jim. Um, and, you know, why, is, why are we talking about T-cell checkpoint modulation? Well, you know, this is what Jim Allison won the Nobel Prize for. Uh, for, you know, CTLA-4 and discovering its function. Uh, also, you know, even, even uh, somewhat uh, advanced in age, older presidents can be cured of uh, what would otherwise have been a death sentence, metastatic lung cancer with these therapies. So this is really what's driven immunotherapy to the forefront. Uh, next slide. However, the reality is that you know, the success of immunotherapy and, and all of the things you see on uh, television at night advertised, Keytruda, Devo, et cetera, really lies primarily in what we consider immune hot cancers. Now they're immune hot because they have large amounts of mutations that make them immune visible, gives your immune system lots to target that's different from self. And also because they have an inflammatory uh, infiltrate at baseline, your immune system's already trying to get some headway there. Those are cancers like melanoma and lung cancer where immunotherapy is, is very uh, significantly effective. 
the problem is of the patients that walk through the door somewhere like MD Anderson, the majority don't have cancers that are targetable by the existing therapies. 55% have what we consider immune cold cancers, very few targetable mutations, very little immune infiltration at baseline. And for those, the existing drugs just don't really work. Overall on the right, you see that, you know, really we can still only treat uh, about 45% of patients with an approved indication for immunotherapy. And within that 45% that we treat, the objective response rate remains under 15%. So really there's, there's significant uh, potential to do better for patients that we can treat. And there's a large uh, group of patients, prostate cancer patients, pancreatic cancer patients, most colorectal patients who we can't treat right now with the existing therapies, but would like to be able to, to bring these benefits of immunotherapy to. Next slide. So, so it helps to understand how the existing drugs work that have been so successful. Keytruda, Opdivo, all of these things. Your cancer has mutations. Those mutations become visible to the immune system, which then activates a T-cell response, uh, those guys in blue right there. At the moment of activation, though, these T-cells upregulate checkpoint molecules, CTLA-4, PD-1. The natural function of these is to put an expiration date on activated killer cells in your immune system. This is a good thing. You get flu, billions of killer cells go to your lungs. Once the flu is gone, you don't want billions of killer cells floating around your lungs looking for things to kill. Uh, unfortunately, tumors cheat and they surround themselves uh, as well as their surrounding stroma or cells they've recruited uh, with ligands for these receptors. So triggers for these off switches, CTLA-4 and PD-1, your T cells try to attack the cancer, but they're just switched off. CTLA-4 gets engaged by B7, PD-1 gets engaged by PD ligands, the immune response is attenuated. Uh, could you click, Jim? But when we block these with antibodies, what happens is we've denied access to these off switches to the tumor and the surrounding tumor stroma. T cells can expand in the tumor microenvironment, eliminate cancer, uh, proliferate, and basically they win this sort of battle of numbers and activity within the tumor microenvironment. Although this looks idealized, the truth is, you know, we can have melanoma patients come in with lung mets, liver mets, hundreds of subcutaneous nodules, 12 to 16 weeks later after treatment with these two drugs, all the cancer is gone. So there really is you know, a, a profound, strong potential of your immune system to eliminate even a bulky systemic cancer. So why doesn't this work better? Um, next slide. Why don't more people experience these benefits that we've talked about? Why, why is there this majority of patients that don't respond? Well, the answer, uh, if you could click one more time, Jim, the answer is that tumors have more in their bag of tricks than just checkpoint blockade. And so we can block PD-1 or CTLA-4, but that doesn't help if, you know, we have a, a, a lot of myeloid suppression, TGF-beta, adenosine, IDO, arginase, uh, cancer-associated fibroblast immune suppression, TGF-beta, direct apoptosis through fast ligand, uh, metabolic barriers such as hypoxia and, and hyper metabolic consumption of nutrients by tumor, all of these things act in a dominant fashion to suppress uh, T cells, even in the context of checkpoint blockade. And so, you know, this is why in these cold cancers, we can't get headway just by blocking PD-1 or CTLA-4. Uh, if you click one more time. So I wanted to take this opportunity to thank Secret though. My lab at MD Anderson uh, has benefited greatly from two Secret uh, investigator awards. One is investigating hypoxia which has led to a very successful clinical trial uh, and a follow-up R01 grant that we're working under right now. Uh, another looking at PDL2, which has directly informed some of the work we're going to tell you about today. Uh, next slide, please. So PDL2. So if you um, if you followed any of this PD1 drug development, you know that you hear a lot about PDL1. So of the FDA approved antibodies, there are three that target PD1, three that target PDL1 somehow PDL2 was left out of the mix. And that's sort of a historical anomaly. Uh, basically, there was a point at which we just didn't have any good reagents to detect PDL2 in humans. And therefore, people assumed, well, if we can't see it, it's not there. It turns out that assumption was quite wrong. PDL2 is expressed widely across the stroma of, of multiple types of human cancers, can be very highly expressed on tumor cells themselves, even more so than PDL1 and is also expressed relevantly on helium. In fact, Merck found that 
uh, sometimes PDL2 levels are more predictive of response to the PD1 blocking drugs like Keytruda than PDL1 is. So we know PDL2 is really important, but that was recent knowledge. Uh, next slide. So our goal uh, was to understand, you know, how can we do better than the existing drugs that just block PD1 or just block PDL1? And key to that is understanding that there are a number of immune interactions that shut down your T cell response in the tumor. And one that wasn't addressed by the existing PD-1 drugs was the interaction of B7-1 and PD-L1, first described by Arlene Sharp and Gordon Freeman at Harvard. As far back as my work with Jim introducing the CTLA-4 PD-1 combination, we actually found that adding a PD-1 and a PD-L1 together gave a superior outcome, more mice cured, by blocking this additional interaction. There have been follow-ups on the upper right, uh, where in pancreatic cancer, you get a better uh, outcome in, in a mouse model and more T cells protected from exhaustion by blocking these together. In the middle, you see that um, human T cells actually are able to remain more active when you additionally block pdl one b 71 And finally, Novartis ran a clinical trial showing that combining these, really shutting down all three of these inhibitory interactions, both PD ligands with PD1 as well as the B71 PDL1, gave superior benefit to patients. Uh, next slide. So this is something we sought to capitalize on by trying to make antibodies based on the limited homology that exists between PDL1 and PDL2 that would recognize both. Uh, if you could click, Jim. In the end, uh, we generated about 100 lead antibodies and found four that had this property to inhibit both PDL1 and PDL2. Two of these, which we call by PDL3 and 4, had quite high affinity. They looked like they were developable. And so after four rounds of affinity maturation, which is quite a lot, uh, we were able to generate uh, what we sought to, which are dual specific PDL1, PDL2 antibodies. Uh, next slide. And so our lead compound, IMGS001, is the best of these, right? It's a dual specific antibody. Each arm of the antibody can bind PDL1 or PDL2 with clinically relevant affinity. This is an advantage. It means the antibody is just as effective in a PDL1 dominated environment as a PDL2 dominated environment as one in which both are balanced, which is, you know, those are the three types that you find across patients. In addition, we've engineered this antibody with effector function. What does that mean? Well, I'll tell you in a minute. So in the upper right, uh, you see that this antibody, as I mentioned, shuts down all three of these inhibitory interactions in a single drug whereas currently that's only possible by combining PD-1 and PD-L1 antibodies. Secondarily, because unlike a PD-1 antibody, we're not targeting the effector cells of the immune system. With PD-L1 and PD-L2, we're targeting the bad guys, tumor, myeloid stroma, myeloid suppressor cells, M2 macrophages, and cancer-associated fibroblasts. These are all the cells mediating those additional layers of immune suppression we want to get rid of. Back to the effector function. So we engineered the antibody so that it can mediate the killing of these cells. It can kill tumor cells directly in addition to blocking this PD-L1, PD-L2 interaction with PD-1. It can kill myeloid stroma that mediates immune suppression. It can kill cancer-associated fibroblasts. How does it do that? Well, with three mutations first characterized and clinically proven uh, by a company called Zencore that enhance both the ability of NK cells to mediate killing of targets that the antibody is bound to as well as importantly, because there aren't a lot of NK cells in most patient solid tumors, uh, ADCP. So what that means is it takes uh, myeloid cells, phagocytes that are in the tumor and it has them eat uh, tumor cells or tumor suppressive stroma. So basically in two different ways, this antibody can mediate killing of PDL1 and PDL2 positive cells. Next slide. That's important because it gets to the advantages this drug has over the existing drugs like Keytruda. As I mentioned, it's the only one that can block this B7 PDL1 that frees up B71 to stimulate T cell responses better through CD28. But it also has two mechanisms of action that aren't present at all in the existing drugs that we think are really important to give this drug the ability to work in cold tumors where the current drugs don't. First, as I mentioned, all of these additional layers of immune suppression come out of the myeloid stroma. They come out of the tumor directly. The dentist IDO, arginase, TGF-beta. What the antibody is doing is not just blocking this PD-1 pathway, it's also eliminating that suppressive burden by mediating direct killing of those cells that are pumping out all of those other immunosuppressive factors. 
This allows T cells to flourish in this environment where they're normally suppressed. Finally, because the antibody drives phagocytosis of tumor cells, um, there's a phenomenon common in these cold tumors that we call immune ignorance. It basically is that although these tumors have antigen that should be visible to the immune system, the immune system never awakens to them because there aren't the cells that, that pick up tumor antigen and show it to your T cell response, your adaptive immune system in an immunogenic context. What the antibody does is almost function like a vaccine. The antibody bound to PD-L1 and PD-L2 positive tumor cells mediates them being eaten by the myeloid cells surrounding them. That activates those macrophages, those dendritic cells, and they traffic to your lymph node and activate a T cell response. So there's also this vaccine effect. The com combination of all three of these gives the antibody an ability to work both very well in hot tumors as well as in cold tumors, as I'll show you. Next slide. So um, CT26 is a, is a very commonly used mouse model. It's a hot tumor in mice, right? Although it's colorectal, it's a hot tumor in mice. Uh, it, it's hot because it has a lot of mutations. It is immune infiltrated. For that reason, it's one of the tumors in mice where existing PD-1 antibodies work best. We used it because a lot of people benchmark their drugs against the existing drugs using this model. And you see PD-1 antibodies do work well in this context. This is akin to melanoma in a patient, right? PD-1 is in the red, you get good tumor control, about 30, 40% of those animals are cured. Even in this setting, which is an ideal setting for the existing drugs, you see that our drug in the light blue or the purple cures 100% of these animals. So even in a setting which is ideal for the existing drugs, a little less ideal for us because these tumors don't express PD-L2 on the tumor cell itself, and because now we're, we're using our antibody in mice where it's a little less active for PDL1, we're still extremely superior to the existing drugs in terms of outcome. That tells us that, you know, even in these hot tumor indications in patients, we're likely to do better than the existing compounds. Next slide. More importantly, so although it's a melanoma, we're talking about mice now, B16 melanoma is an extremely cold tumor. And that's illustrated by the fact that the PD-1 antibody now, so sort of mouse Keytruda in the red, doesn't work at all here. There's no uh, monotherapy efficacy for either PD-1 or CTLA-4 blockade against B16. However, even in this completely cold context, our drug is a monotherapy, cures 20 or 25% of these animals, and overall uh, extends survival to double or triple what it is at baseline. So really you're having a very, very profound therapeutic benefit in a model where the existing drugs are a complete zero. Uh, this gets to our vision for IMGS-001 as a foundation for immunotherapy across both hot and cold cancers. Not only will we be more effective, functional as a monotherapy or in combinations for patients with hot cancers, but in patients with cold tumors, finally, we're gonna have a curative potential baseline to build even better combinations on. And so with that, I'm gonna let Jim hit one more slide and um, turn it back to him. But thank you for your attention um, and for this opportunity. Thanks, Dr. Curran, really appreciate that. And thank you to CPRIT for inviting us to speak. We're extremely excited about the CPRIT grant that we received. Uh, it was a uh, critical milestone for the company and has really propelled us now to uh, our, our future development and additional fundraising efforts. So let me talk a little bit about immunogenesis as a company and then specifically on IMGS-001, which is, which is what the CEPRA grant is, is specifically focused on. So when we talk about immunogenesis, as you heard from Dr. Curran, he's one of the pioneers of, of modern immuno-oncology. And so from that seat, he's seen what has worked and what hasn't worked. And in his lab at MD Anderson, he's focused on how do we take these advances and expand them to cold tumors. Uh, and so we've set up a pipeline of different interventions that we think can have a major impact on bringing efficacy to cold tumors. So when you look at our team, uh, you, you've met Dr. Kern and I, uh, we have a ex uh, very experienced senior management team uh, that is, uh, is critical as we execute across three different programs. Our board has also been very helpful to the company. Um, You'll, make, you'll, you'll notice some of the names here. Certainly Andrew Strong is, um, is, has been critical to the company as we've gotten up and running. And I know the CEPR community knows Andrew well. 
Um, David Hong is someone from MD Anderson that we've worked closely with. He's collaborated with Mike on a number of projects and he's the, currently the PI on over 40 clinical trials, many of them immuno-oncology focused. And so his insights on how to design good clinical trials that will lead to clinically meaningful outcomes are absolutely critical as the company moves forward. So Dr. Curran talked about this. I won't um, spend a lot of time here, but what I will mention is our vision for IMGS-01 is to be a superior foundation of PD-1 blockade. If you look at that lower left corner where most of the tumors sit, the response rate's less than 5%. But, but the industry has accepted this as a foundation and they've tried to build on it by throwing hundred, hundreds, thousands of combination approaches on top of it. They've tried to they're trying to build by specifics on top of this base. And although that could lead to some success, it may only bring the response rate up to 15 or 20% with multiple different interventions. And if you wanna go any higher, you're gonna to have to layer a third or a fourth drug on top, which is quite difficult to do. So we see a tremendous opportunity where we can bring that foundation up to 20 or 25% response rate with a single drug which would have a huge impact by itself, but would also be a springboard to driving efficacy even higher by layering additional interventions on top of that strong foundation. So when you look at our pipeline, IMGS-001, which is the focus of the CPRIC grant, is our lead asset and what we believe will be a superior foundation of PD-1 blockade. We also have a unique approach to sting agonism with the most potent sting agonist that's been described in the literature. And where this is critical is we are proposing to conjugate our sting with, with one of our proprietary antibodies and deliver it systemically so it can traffic to all the various sites of tumor, which, is, which will overcome a key limitation of, of current sting agonist. We've also seen some exciting efficacy in glioblastoma. Um, because our sting is so potent, we think it can be effective through direct injection into glioblastoma. So we're looking at a potential development program there. We also have a um, anti-hypoxia program. Dr. Curran mentioned one of the secret grants where he was studying hypoxia. We are developing the only known reducer of solid tumor hypoxia and combining that with checkpoint inhibitors. Uh, there was exciting data from a phase one at MD Anderson with CTLA-4 plus IMGS-101. And we're looking to start a phase two this year. Um, and we're gonna add a PD-1 inhibitor into the mix as well. Uh, and we're excited about the potential to uh, register this, this combination based on that phase two. So let's talk about IMGS-01 and, and where the CPRIT funding will, will take us. And so the CPRIT funding is absolutely critical to getting the company ready to file an IND. Um, and that will really be a key driver for us to raise Series A financing, which we hope to do this year. So we, we've done some master shell banking on um, on this molecule and it's shown that it's manufactured quite well. This was with a manufacturer in Germany. We moved manufacturing to Fujifilm in Texas uh, in connection with our CPRIT grant. So we're very excited for that. We're starting cell, from cell line development with Fujifilm because that was the, uh, the, the most efficient way to start that process was to go ahead and start at the base from cell line development. We've talked to the FDA and the FDA has signed off on our proposed GLP tox plan um, we're going to start with a non-GLP PKPD study in May in, in, um, in non-human primates and then move to a GLP tox study in the July-August timeframe. We plan to hold a pre-IND meeting with the FDA in Q3 of this year. We're finalizing our phase 1A, 1B clinical trial and plan to hold a clinical ad board in, in April to further refine that. And then we'll conduct an additional IND enabling work in 2021 including looking at efficacy in humanized mouse models, uh, validating our biomarkers, and optimizing our dose and, and schedule of, um, uh, of administering the, the, this drug. And so the, the CPRIT grant is really going to be a driver to funding all of these activities and will be absolutely essential to us bringing this important intervention to patients. In the interest of time, I, I will give a high level overview of the clinical trial plan, but the CPRIT funding will take us through this phase 1A, 1B trial. Um, the phase 1A is a traditional dose escalation. We're, we're going to do an, uh, a 
expedited three by three where we continue to go up in dose until we see a grade two. And at that point, then we'll stop and do a traditional three by three design. We have two arms in the expansion. One is PDL1 failures. There's a lot of these patients across triple negative breast, head and neck, hepatocellular. Uh, and we think we can reverse the failure in these patients uh, because PDL2 may be a major factor or be, and or because there may be immunosuppressive stroma that our mechanism can uniquely address. Arm B is more um, of the traditional cold tumors. And these patients will most likely be PD-1 or PDL one naive patients across prostate, ovarian, colorectal, where we'll seek to show that this intervention can have efficacy in cold tumors. We also are looking at multiple different biomarker approaches. I'm looking at PDL1, PDL2 dual expression. And we're also going to look at a molecular marker 9P24.1, um, which correlates with PDL1, PDL2 expression. And what's exciting is if 9P24.1 is predictive of clinical efficacy, we have the opportunity to get a cross tumor indication similar to what Merck has received uh, for MSI high patients with Keytruda. There's also an exciting extension um, off of IMDS-001 because it's the way it's designed is as a single antibody right now. We could actually take one of the arms, one of the fab fragments from the antibody and swap it out for another immune modulator. For example, 41BB or CTLA-4. At that point, it becomes a traditional bispecific, but we're hitting three different targets. And this is, this is where the industry and the field is going, is to hit multiple targets with a single antibody. And there's solid biologic rationale for both of these combinations. So once we show that IMGS-001 is safe and see some early signs of effectiveness, this would be an exciting platform extension to move into these tri-targeting bispecifics. So um, in, in closing, the, the CPRIT funding will be critical in allowing us to establish proof of concept for what we think is a groundbreaking therapy. If this, if this therapy works, it's not going to be an incremental change. It's going to be uh, a, a huge change in how um, cold tumors are treated and potentially all tumors um, once, we, once we can show more data in hot tumors. So the, the goals for the phase 1A, 1B, which is what CPRIT will help drive, is to generate this initial proof that IMGS-001 is a superior foundation of PD-1 pathway blockade, and specifically that it's effective in cold tumors. We have the opportunity in future trials to layer combination treatments on top of IMGS-001 and, and show that we can drive efficacy higher. We also have the potential, as I mentioned, to look at 9P24.1 amplification, which could set us up for a potential molecular indication across different cancers. And that would be uh, very exciting and, um, and, and quite groundbreaking. And then we have this platform expansion opportunity where we, we could expand into, into tri-targeting by specifics uh, if we show that the, the main molecule is safe and effective. So we are, um, we are extremely excited for this molecule and the potential that it has to make a huge impact on patients. And the CPRIT funding is going to be absolutely essential in us, not only getting it ready for IND, but also generating this proof um, of concept in the phase 1A, 1B trial. Let me stop there and, and take any questions, uh, either for myself or Dr. Kern. Thank you. Uh, members, are there any questions? If I could ask a question, Dr. Kern. Um, thank you very much for the presentation and the explanation of a very complex subject. Well, one of the things I get out of your presentation is that stroma, the tumor stroma has got an important role to play. Aside from the hypoxia studies, are there any other ways to manipulate the tumor stromal tissue? It's a really good question, and it's the focus of a tremendous amount of um, research in the field. Um, so some people, if I'm speaking broadly, you know, some have opted to go after the specific mechanisms of stromal suppression one by one, right? And some of those approaches um, have failed, I think, because there's so much redundancy, such as what you saw with the IDO inhibitors, which were, you know, failed a very large phase three trial. 
but others may be successful, such as, you know, even adenosine receptor inhibition seems to actually have some significant uh, efficacy as a monotherapy. I think the problem with the one by one approach is that there's a lot of heterogeneity patient to patient as to which of these sort of stromal suppressive effector mechanisms is the most critical one. And also there's a lot of redundancy. And unfortunately the compounds we have today um, have pretty significant side effects such that it's hard to stack, you know, three or four or five to kind of cover all the bases. And so what, where people have turned and, you know, it's the direction we've gone is um, toward targeting the, the more immunosuppressive stromal cells themselves either for elimination or for functional repolarization. And so, you know, the, the effector function in our antibody represents, you know, a way to eliminate those cells. Others have taken approaches that are either designed to affect the, the differentiation or to, you know, with the sting agonist, for instance, it's also in our pipeline, um, many others are working on that as a way to activate innate immune programming within the myeloid stroma, at least, to deprogram the tumor-induced suppressive programming and reprogram a pro-inflammatory state. None of those approaches have sort of advanced to a point that they're close to FDA approval yet, but I think at, at a level of preclinical efficacy and early clinical understanding, we're seeing potential for both, both the innate reprogramming at the level of activating innate sensors and increasing phagocytosis, um, as well as at the elimination stage with antibodies that are designed to actually specifically uh, reduce this burden of these very suppressive cells, either M2 macrophages, MDSC, or others. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, I Thank you. Okay, uh, Ambrosio, go ahead. Yes, sir. A great presentation. It's uh, mind-boggling what you guys are doing. Um, I'm just curious if you guys can identify all these pathways and antigens on cells. Um, and again, it's a, a beautiful work what you're doing. I just I got to ask if you can do that. Are you guys also uh, targeting the apoptosis pathways, like the cell path, if, and you know, kind of kill them from within? If you stimulate that instead of trying to, you know, identify them and circle them, neutralize them so cells can then go kill them off. I, I mean, it is amazing work what you're doing, but I'm just wondering in parallel, are you guys, or is anybody doing that kind of work where you can kill them from within? Um, I, you know, we should talk sometime because that sounds like a really interesting idea. <laughs> I think it's it's hard to find those triggers, right? And and actually, you know, interesting, the way that, the way that uh, NK cells, which will be doing some of the killing based on the antibody, the way that they kill is the same as T cells. They release these cytotoxic granules. The way that those cytotoxic granules work is actually by triggering apoptosis uh, in the target cell. Um, and, and actually that can be good. Occasionally we find patients who resist these therapies and we find that they their tumors have actually upregulated anti-apoptotic mechanisms. So, uh, so you know, there, there is the opportunity for resistance, even when you can trigger uh, those apoptotic pathways exactly where you want them. You know, tum tumors, unfortunately, do survival pretty well. And um, some of those survival pathways actually afford resistance to granule-mediated uh, killing. But, but no, we, we haven't actually found a way to sort of specifically trigger apoptosis in those cells, although there is research in those areas uh, by others using... Uh, molecules called Protax. Thank you, sir. Sure, thank you. A very quick question, Mr. Chairman. This is Will Montgomery. Go ahead. Uh, Dr. Kern, Mr. Barlow, I, would you do me a favor? I went to high school with your CFO, Bill Tanner. <laughs> would you tell him hello from Will Montgomery? We will, Dude. and he'll be thrilled. <laughs> Good. Great. And we know he graduated. That's good. <laughs> right. Proof. It only took eight yeah. years. It only took yeah, we're, not so sure. <laughs> we're not so sure about that Montgomery guy, but we know Tanner made it. <laughs> all right. If there are no more questions, we'll move on to it. Thank you all again for your presentation. Very informative. Thank you guys uh, so much for everything. Thank you. Really appreciate it.
We'll move on now to agenda item number six. Mr. Roberts will provide the chief executive officer's report. Thank you, Mr. Margo. I'll start off by congratulating you for your recent reappointment for another six year term on our board. Um, um, I don't know if it's because you like it or you're a glutton for punishment, but uh, thank you very much for your willingness to, to serve. Uh, very quickly, uh, we have going into today's meeting uh, nearly $250 million available out of 2021 appropriations. Uh, therefore, we certainly have enough money to cover today's uh, recommendations that will, will be coming forward to you. Um, I want to have a, a stop here for a minute uh, and introduce you to a, a new staff member that we're going to have come on board on March 1st. Uh, Tracy Davies is going to be joining us in a new staff position as the Chief Intellectual Property and Strategic Initiatives Officer. As we enter our second decade, our portfolio of intellectual property created in advance through our funding continues to grow. Ms. Davies will help guide the strategic development of our IP portfolio, as well as identify new ways to integrate our cancer prevention and research efforts with new public-private partnerships. Uh, at this point, uh, uh, I'd like to introduce Tracy, uh, let her come on, maybe say a, a word or two uh, as to why she wants to join us and, and uh, open herself up for any uh, pillaring that the Oversight Committee would, would like to do. Tracy? Thanks, Wayne. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's nice to see you all. I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to make it this morning because of the situation we're all sort of enduring here. Uh, we've been without power for three days. Uh, I, my heart went out to Dr. Curran, who went to a hotel, and then the hotel went, <laughs> lost its power. Um, we haven't gone to that effort yet, but it, it is really nice to see you all. Um, and I'm delighted to be joining CPRIT in March. Uh, I'm, I go back a ways with CPRIT, although I stepped away for some time. I worked with Kristen right at the inception of CPRIT to help with some of the rulemaking and have kept in touch with Kristen over the course of the last decade plus and watched uh, with tremendous uh, admiration and respect uh, what uh, Wayne and the rest of you have done with this um, unprecedented agency and uh, was really looking for uh, an opportunity to give back to the state and to my community and I'm pleased that it has come together so that I can work it with CPRIT, um, helping with the intellectual property portfolio and going through Sunset Review in the next legislative session and other uh, initiatives that uh, will take CPRIT forward into the next iteration of the agency. Um, I look forward to working with each and every one of you in that regard as well. Um, I'm sure we'll have lots of opportunities to talk as we go forward. So I'll, I'll stop there, answer any questions you have. And um, again, uh, I'm delighted to be here. Thanks, Wayne. Uh, welcome officially, Tracy. Are there uh, any questions from any of the members for Tracy? Uh, Tracy, could you give us maybe just 10 seconds on your background? Sure, sure. So um, I, uh, I have, in terms of my educational background, I have a master's in public health, uh, specifically in pharmacology and toxicology from the University of Minnesota. Um, and then I went on and I got my law degree at the University of Minnesota as well. But I moved here the day after law school graduation, I was ironically finished with the Minnesota weather um, and, uh, and it made it to Texas. So I've lived in Texas now almost 25 years and have, have practiced uh, the, in the private practice of law for that entire time. I started my practice uh, doing a lot of uh, patent prosecution, patent portfolio development uh, with um, universities, all sorts of other uh, research facilities, as well as companies at every stage of development. Um, as my career progressed uh, and some of my smaller clients grew into bigger clients and had success products, 
uh, one of the sad realities of that is if you have a successful product, particularly in the life science space, you will end up in litigation. And so I found myself uh, uh, doing uh, open and closing arguments and cross-examinations in court and, um, and, and really have spent the last 12 to 15 years as a, um, as a lead trial counsel in not just patent cases, but any type of case where it is important to be able to translate complicated technical information to a lay judge or jury. Um, and then that, that sort of grew, um, it got to the point where it's mostly representing large multinational conglomerate pharmaceutical companies in um, conflicts, not just in the US, but on a global basis. So leading teams of lawyers throughout the world um, on, on their pharmaceutical product disputes, uh, which happen when they get to a certain level of maturity or contract disputes or false claims investigations from the government if it required the jury or the judge to understand the technology, um, which then sort of led into a very high level crisis management for those types of companies. Um, and, and that's really what I've, I've done the last many years. Uh, but after 25 years in the private practice of law. As I said, I was ready, uh, change ready. It's time to give back um, and be more involved locally in, in Texas. I live in Austin and I always have. Um, and, uh, and I'm looking forward to, to uh, coming home, uh, so to speak. Not being a elite status on two different airlines will be nice. <laughs> It'll be nice to be at home for a while. Very, very impressive. Welcome to Texas. Thank you. Thank you. Will, did you have a question? I do have a question, Ms. Davies. Welcome, glad to have you. Did you know that Mr. Margo had been re reappointed when you accepted this job? Because <laughs> you may wish to reconsider because now he's in for another six years. And I just want to make sure that you uh, came in with your eyes open. Uh, uh, Willie. I have to say <laughs> there was full disclosure and, and I'm pretty good at asking questions. So uh, I, I, I knew and, uh, and I, I saw that as a positive. <laughs> Good answer. Yeah, yeah. Politically correct, Tracy. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> go ahead and continue. Welcome, Tracy. Thank you. And go ahead, Wayne. All right. Thank, well, you. thank you. Thank you, Tracy. Um, uh, the next item, my legislative session update is uh, perpetually evolving. Um, it changed again this morning. Uh, a week or so ago now, well, I guess on February the 9th, Heidi and I presented our budget request to the Senate Finance Committee. Uh, it was a pretty um, uneventful meeting. Um, uh, we, as I reported previously, uh, are extremely happy with the Senate's initial round of recommendations for us. Um, the House Appropriations Committee was actually supposed to begin uh, organizing this afternoon uh, with an overview of several of the major policy budget issue areas facing the legislature this session. Uh, but uh, no surprise, uh, they've had to postpone that fact. They've canceled all week, all this week's meetings. Uh, my guess is they will pick that back up again uh, uh, Monday or Tuesday, uh, weather, weather permitting. Uh, and that would put us into a position of testifying towards the maybe the end of next week, I think more likely the week of March the, the 1st. Uh, House uh, recommendations for us uh, follow the traditional pattern of uh, just continuing agency operations. Uh, in our case, that's a positive because as you'll recall, we were not instructed to reduce our base request like so many agencies were. Uh, so they do recommend full funding for the agency, but uh, the exceptional item requests for new personnel uh, are not included. Uh, the position, uh, the exempt position salary increase for the chief scientific officer wasn't granted in either house, but that's not a surprise. Uh, those decisions are always left uh, to the very end of the budget conference committee. The one thing House Appropriations did do uh, was a variation of our transfer authority. Uh, I'll spare you the details of, of that right now, uh, but uh, we have had uh, 
uh, a more restrictive uh, transfer requirement put on us as a result of the problems that occurred in 2012 and 2013 uh, that have the restrictions, though we've never had a request denied uh, through the process. Uh, sometimes the delays are extraordinarily, extraordinarily long, uh, which has hampered our operations on, a, on, a, on occasion. Uh, but uh, they, they have done a variation that, that, that should, help, should help with that. Um, last thing I'd like to say with respect to the budget, again, is, as reported previously, um, we got surprised uh, early in January uh, with an increase in what is called SWICAP, the statewide uh, cost allocation plan uh, that we get assessed, many agencies get assessed uh, for using uh, services at state agencies like the comptroller, the state auditor, the attorney general. Uh, and uh, it was an enormous increase uh, from roughly, uh, if I recall correctly, 68,000 uh, to $450,000, a 552% increase um, that is going to be, uh, it's not going to be able to be absorbed uh, under our current budget uh, situation. So we will need to uh, request a transfer from the research programs to administration to cover this. However, um, we need more information as to the calculation that led to this dramatic increase. Yesterday, I sent a letter to the governor's office that is actually in charge of the consultant that developed this report, asking for greater information so that we understand what is happening. Uh, I hope to get that information relatively quickly uh, and would want that before I try and, and draft a request to the Legislative Budget Board uh, for, the, for this transfer. Again, it's extremely unfortunate that this came up uh, subsequent to our submitting our budget request. Uh, it might have been able to be accommodated in the base bills, uh, certainly in the Senate, uh, but uh, it has added to the length of our presentations to the, to the different committees. Um, coming to uh, an end here uh, on page, um, uh, on attachment three, on page 3-8 uh, is a summary of the chief scientific officer search. Hopefully later this morning, you will approve uh, the executive search firm contract. Um, and uh, I included in the memo uh, the members of the oversight committee uh, and others that will be participating in the interview process for the chief scientific officer. Uh, behind uh, that appendix uh, on page 3-10, if you will turn to that, is my statutorily required report uh, to you on the progress and continued merit of each research program. I am, of course, pleased to report that despite the interruptions caused by COVID-19, this marked another great year of progress for CPRIT and all three of its programs. Uh, key metrics indicate that CPRIT is affecting Texas's national standing in both cancer research and the biomedical industry. Our investment in intellectual and research support infrastructure in Texas is attracting, creating, and expanding the research capabilities of our institutions of higher ed, as well as our state's life sciences industry. They expedite innovation and are increasing the likelihood of breakthroughs in cancer prevention and cures. I, I think that um, uh, if you would spend some time with this memo, uh, it provides an excellent overview of what the benefits CPRT has been provided, is providing to Texas and to the knowledge of, of cancer uh, in, in the world. Uh, it's one of the, as I said, one of the nice tightest uh, explanations of what we do. Uh, and I'll give kudos to Cameron Eckel, who was the primary drafter of, of this memo for the book. 
uh, but I do encourage you to maybe stick this in your coat pockets uh, for future reference because I, I think there's a, a lot there. Finally, um, CPRT again, as reported previously, has uh, completed its 2020 annual report. Um, and this is the first time that we have done this uh, totally uh, online uh, on the website. Uh, the platform, we think, will provide our stakeholders with a much more uh, interactive experience. Yeah, okay, all right. A much more interactive experience to review our many accomplishments. Uh, the format, uh, I will again give kudos to others. Uh, it's the initiative of Kristen Doyle, who did much of the writing, uh, shepherding information from the programs, uh, combined with the efforts of always information technology, uh, particularly Shannon Kusick and Terry Simeon. Uh, this was an enormous effort on theirs over the last uh, three to four months, and I am extremely proud of the, the website that, that is, is, uh, got, it, got it on. I've asked Kristen if we can still do it to give a, a short demonstration of the annual report, and uh, when she does that, uh, Mr. Margo, that will conclude uh, the CEO report. Hey, Kristen. Hi, let me share my video real quick. Okay, so um, I also want to uh, give recognition to Terry and Shannon, as well as Chris. Chris Catrone, you know, deserves special credit. He worked with all of the programs and the grantees to coordinate the stories. You know, you guys know we have more than a decade worth of grants and grant projects. So we have so many stories to tell about the brilliant work that's being done by grantees across Texas. So when we started talking about the format for the 2020 annual report, it was Terry that suggested that we move this annual report all online. Um, it really gives us an opportunity to showcase the work of the grantees and to link to a lot of our resources that we already have on our website. So for example, when we talk about any grant project, we have their grant ID number you can hyperlink, you know, it's click on that grant ID number and it will take you directly to the grants funded page that gives more of an explanation about that project. Um, you know, we have more than 100 different examples of grantees in this annual report um, and we were able to feature the work of 41 different community organizations, academic research institutions and companies through this. So it's, it's really different than any format that we've used before. And we're always trying to find ways to talk about the work that the grantees do, you know, rather it's the grantee presentations that we kick off the oversight committee meetings with, um, or the activities updates that we give you every month. But uh, the annual report is a really important part of that. I, I want to focus on just three quick um, parts of the report. The first part is in our fiscal year 2020 highlights. Um, you know, in addition to talking about uh, all of the awards that you guys approved for fiscal year 2020, we did have a special section on COVID-19. So not, not only do we talk about how this impacted the grantees and what CPRIT did to help address those stresses for the grantees, but we were also able to talk about and feature how our grantees were able to pivot, especially those grantees that are providing prevention screening services or had ongoing clinical trials. So one of the examples that we gave was Dr. Berenson's COVID-19 clinical study that she was doing um, and you know, talked about how they were able to continue that study even while Galveston was in its lockdown in the initial months. Another thing that we were able to feature in this section is the work, um, the cancer research and technology that CPRT has funded over the past decade, how some of that work was also able to help the vaccine, uh, vaccinations and treatments 
for COVID-19. So it's a great example of how the research that's being funded for cancer is also helping in other areas, um, not only in Texas, but worldwide. So an, another place in our annual report um, that we were able to focus on is in the R mission. You know, so this was a way that we could really connect the you know, CPRIT's three-part mission, you know, to um, invest in the academic prowess of our institutions, uh, to create and expand the life science infrastructure in Texas, and to fund innovative cancer prevention and cancer research projects. So one of the many things, and you can see as we're, scan as we're scrolling through this, one of the many things that we were able to feature was the work that CEPR does in terms of training the next generation of cancer researchers. You know, so instead of just talking about uh, that we fund you know, 21 different research training programs at nine different institutions across the state, we were able to give specific examples of each, you know, of, of, of some of the trainees who've gone through the program and what they're doing. Another, uh, the last thing that I want to highlight for you is in the, the, the planning and priorities section. You know, so this really is a feature of the program priorities that the oversight committee passes every year. So, you know, instead of just providing the program priorities, we were able to show how those priorities are in practice in each of the programs. You know, so for academic research, we highlighted the program priority for childhood cancer research, um, for product development research. We were able to um, showcase the 17 companies that have developed the intellectual property that was created at academic institutions in Texas. And then the one that I wanted to show you was the prevention um, program priority and practice. This is the underserved populations. And the project, the project that we're focusing on is a project that we funded for the Community Network for Cancer Prevention. So that's a group that's um, Baylor College Medicine, Harris Health System, and other partners. Um, and with this, we were able to tell the story of um, their work in targeting the Vietnamese community and in increasing breast cancer screenings and, and colon cancer screenings. And we were able to provide even the, the um, videos that they use, that they put on, um, on uh, TVs within um, Harris County. You know, it just gives you a lot more feeling for what it is that secret and its grantees do. So uh, I, I hope that you get a chance, if you haven't done so already, to really look through the annual report. And I'll say, you know, it's never too early to start thinking about the fiscal year 2021 report. So if oversight committee members have any ideas on grantees or grant projects that they'd like to feature, you know, please let us know and we'll start working on this. Thank you, Kristen. Are there any uh, questions for uh, Wayne or Kristen from the Oversight Committee? Uh, the only question I have is, and I'll preempt Montgomery for the question is, how uh, how recent is your picture in that annual report, Wayne? Just, just curious. <laughs> it's fairly recent, um, and I I suspected that. Uh, I might get a comment or two about that. I will point out, uh, and Kristen better verify this, that, that that picture went in there over my strong protest, uh, but they thought it would be a nice, nice feature. Uh, I'm not sure I like it being the first thing that pops up, but. <laughs> well, if you can't Photoshop it, that's okay. I think, uh, they, I think they did Photoshop it. <laughs> and, uh, and I want to remind the uh, members of the Oversight Committee that uh, Dr. Rice is the chairman of the uh, uh, Selection Committee uh, recruitment. And if there are any questions or issues, uh, they need to go to Dr. Rice. 
and uh, it's nice to uh, see you. I thought you were a helicopter pilot for a while there with your earphones on, but uh, uh, it's nice to have you back. Okay, let's move on. Mr. Margo, uh, yes. I want to state on the record that Dr. Cummings has lost his phone power also. All of the phone lines are down, so he is no longer participating in the meeting. Thank you, Kristen. They're going through a lot in San Angelo right now, as well as the rest of Texas. We actually are coming out of it. Uh, most everything's melted here and, and it's warming up, but uh, it wasn't good. Um, right. So the chair recognizes Mr. Burgess to present the chief compliance officer's report. Good morning, Mr. Margo. Thank you. Good morning, oversight committee members. Uh, you'll find my compliance officer report behind tab four. Just a couple of areas I'd like to highlight. Uh, one is the uh, delinquent reporting uh, we had uh, as of the end of January, uh, about 23 reports that were delinquent. Um, as you are well aware, we meet uh, on a weekly basis and uh, across the agency and uh, work to make sure those reports get submitted on time and uh, reach out to the grantees and work with uh, our grant accountant staff, our operations staff and, and program staff. It's still slightly below the 5% uh, threshold, and that's kind of a self-imposed threshold of about 28 reports, um, but we continue to monitor that closely. The other area that I'd like to just highlight on uh, page 4-2, uh, the match expenditures review. You know, this is a newer activity for the compliance team, um, and uh, as you are aware, uh, academic research and product development research grantees uh, are required to demonstrate they have uh, available unspent funds equal to at least one half of the CEPRT grant award to be spent on the uh, CEPRT funded project. And we refer to this as the matching funds requirement. Um, they have to certify that at the beginning and then at the end of every grant year, they provide a, a report to us of how they spent that money. I also note that administrative code and secrets rules allow you know, institutions of higher ed to use their federal indirect cost rate as a credit towards that match. So like I mentioned, uh, grantees are required to provide a detailed match expenditure report uh, on an annual basis and the compliance staff um, now go in and review 100% of those expenses on an annual basis to uh, test for appropriateness and allowability. Um, and in January, we were working on three of those. Um, I think to date we've done eight or 10. Um, and we've reviewed a little over $19 million in match expenses so far. So um, that process is still being refined and we work very closely with grant accountants uh, and the grantee to remedy any um, unallowable expenses. And that's all I'd like to highlight. Any questions on my report? Are there any questions for Mr. Burgess? Okay. Uh, turning, turning to cert certification of the recruitment slate that we will consider today, Mr. Burgess will provide the compliance certification report. Thank you, Mr. Margo. Uh, the compliance certification, you'll find that in your uh, proposed grant award booklet. Uh, I think that's on page 21. Uh, the memo is dated February 2nd, and that was also made available to you uh, in the OC portal. Uh, just a couple of awards for your consideration today. Um, as part of the certification, uh, we look at every step in the process from approval of the RFA all the way through uh, OC approval and, and uh, we use a grant pedigree. Uh, as part of my certification, I have conversations uh, conferred with CEPRIT staff and GDIT or General Dynamics Information Technology, our third party grants administrator. And I review uh, all the supporting documentation, uh, including third party observer reports, uh, peer review meetings of all the peer review meetings, uh, conflict of interest, sign out sheets, 
uh, post review statements. Um, I am satisfied that the uh, application review process uh, followed um, applicable laws and CEPRIS administrative rules, and I certify the academic research award recommendations for your consideration this morning. Are there any questions for Mr. Burgess? Okay, hearing none, we will. We are on agenda item eight now. The chair recognizes Dr. Wilson to provide the academic research program update and introduce the program integration committee's grant award recommendations. Thank you. I'm going to begin with um, the uh, pick award recommendations. Um, there are two shown in this uh, slide uh, in response to the recruitment of established investigator RFA. Um, the first is to University of Texas Health Science Center, San Antonio, um, to enable recruitment of Alexander Mason, a uh, biochemist currently at Drexel University in Philadelphia. Um, he is expert in renown in the area of DNA repair. And his recruitment is notable um, in that the uh, UT Health Science Center San Antonio is building a critical number of uh, individuals with expertise in this area. You heard from Dr. Sung last oversight committee meeting about the importance of DNA repair in both novel therapeutics as well as diagnostics. So um, hopefully this will be a successful recruitment to continue to build a area of real renown in Texas. Um, the second is an established investigator award recommendation to Baylor College of Medicine, uh, enabling the recruitment of Othan Iliopoulos. Uh, Dr. Iliopoulos is a physician scientist currently at Massachusetts General Hospital and Harvard Medical School. He's a recognized expert in uh, area of understanding the uh, biology of kidney cancer development and using that information uh, for novel therapeutics. His recruitment to Baylor College of Medicine would be in a leadership position for their translational research program. Um, so these are the two pick recommendations for um, the oversight committee consideration this morning. Any questions for Dr. Wilson? Hearing none, Mr. Burgess certified compliance for the academic research award process. It's my understanding that no oversight committee member reported any conflicts of interest. Are there any conflicts of interest not reported? Members, you have the list of applications and grant amounts recommended by the PIC for the academic research grant awards. We'll approve the PIC recommendation if two thirds of the oversight committee members agree. There is one academic recruitment slate constituting two grant recommendations. Rather than taking a separate vote, I will ask for a vote to approve both awards. If a member wants to consider an award recommendation separately, please make a motion to do so now. Hearing none, I will entertain a motion to approve the PIC's two recommendations for the recruitment of established investigators. So moved. Second. Second. Okay. All in favor, vote aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing approval from at least two thirds of the members, the motion carries. I will entertain a motion delegating contract negotiation authority to the CEO and CPRT staff and to authorize the CEO to sign the contracts on behalf of CPRT. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor, vote aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries. The chair recognizes Ms. Maggot to provide the chief prevention officer's report. Good morning again, members. Um, the prevention report can be found uh, um, behind tab nine in your booklets. And the first part of it is a brief summary of FY 2021, um, where we stand with the cycles. 
The prevention subcommittee asked me on February 9th in their meeting to um, provide some information on the impact COVID is having on the screenings, diagnostics, and vaccinations provided by CPRIT grantees. And the detailed information is there. Basically, um, we don't have a full year because the uh, grantees will report on March 15th, but I can update this when that happens. But right now it's showing that uh, the screenings, diagnostics and vaccinations, there was a 31% decrease. Um, grantees have reported to me, but that their numbers are going back up. Does anyone have any questions or comments about the COVID impact? Well, it, it seems that we discussed this at the, uh, Mr. Margo, I'm sorry, it, uh, I didn't wait for recognition, but we discussed this, the prevention committee, uh, prevention subcommittee. It seems like what's brewing here is a, a massive wave of trouble because people are not keeping up with their regular uh, appointments. And I just wonder if there's anything that we can do to, um, you know, get the word out that people ought to be keeping up with screenings and regular appointments so that we don't have a flood of problems resulting from inattention to continued health. How can we, can, can we publicly, is there a way for CEPRA to publicly get this word out uh, through press or, or whatever. And I'll, I'll, Ramona, I'll leave it to you and Chris to tell us. Certainly we um, do that. Wayne, did you wanna make any comments? Yes, and, and the answer to your question, uh, Mr. Margo is yes. Um, I understand that uh, a press release was discussed either coming out from the agency or the oversight committee. Um, I think that will have some impact, uh, but keeping in mind that we are far from the only uh, interested uh, funder uh, about this problem with the decline in, in the prevention services, the American Cancer Society, the Komen Foundation uh, are interested in it as well. And uh, Ramona and I discussed the possibility of, of working with them uh, on doing uh, some kind of outreach to publicize this. Uh, something that did come up uh, in other discussions was uh, we have had uh, on our website uh, the impact of COVID and particularly uh, steps the agency has taken, uh, uh, at frequently asked questions from our grantees how to solve problems uh, that we may uh, sub in uh, something uh, that is an ongoing discussion of, of this problem. We, we haven't fully baked this idea, but that had a, a strong appeal to me. Uh, that's something we could establish. And then in, in our press release or whoever uh, does a press release on this, they can, they can refer to the information we have on our website. Okay, thank you, Wayne. Um, Ramona, have you finished? Are you continuing? I have one, the action item for the proposed um, FY 2022 RFAs. I wanted to share my screen to show you the timeline. There were there are five proposed RFAs. A short description is in your packet. The prevention subcommittee has recommended approval of these. And then on the next slide is the um, shows you the timeline that is proposed. Let me see if I can share my screen. There it is. Thank you. Um, and this is just a, a, a high level. Specific dates will be added um, soon when the timelines come out. So with that, um, ask for your consideration for these FY 2022 RFA mechanisms. Are there any questions? Mr. I will entertain a motion. Before you entertain the motion, I just wanted to make it clear that these RFAs are for both cycles of fiscal year 2022, not just the first cycle. Okay, thank you. 
I will entertain a motion approving the proposed timeline and prevention program RFAs for the first cycle of FY 2022. So moved. And again, I just want to make it clear that it's for all cycles of this All year. cycles, 21 and 22. Okay. There's been a motion. Second. Is there a second? second. Okay. All in favor, vote aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries. Dr. Walker Peach, will you provide the product development program update? Mr. Marvo, also after Dr. Walker Peach is done with her presentation, um, I want to note that uh, Dr. Wilson had more of his presentation to provide. So we'll loop back to that agenda item once Dr. Walker, Walker Peach is done with her presentation. Okay. Uh, hi again, everyone. Good morning again. Um, I hope I can make this. My power has can, has been going on and off all morning during our during our meeting here, so I'll be quick. So you will find our um, report um, after behind tab number seven in your meeting uh, notebook, and I will provide you with two updates. One is on our current FY 2021 cycle one applicant pool. We had opened up that, um, that application cycle with all three of our standard uh, mechanisms, the Texco, RELCO, and SEED award mechanisms in November of last year and closed at the end of January in our current year. This is what our current pool looks like. We have eight applicants and the Texco award mechanism. Um, we've got six from the RELCO award mechanism and a very large number of seeds. This is probably the largest uh, cohort of seed applicants we have seen, at least since I have been here. Uh, so we have a total of 36 applicants in this award cycle uh, for just slightly over $254 million. Uh, and so we'll continue with peer review along that cycle. We uh, anticipate that I'll be able to make, bring our recommendations, the pick recommendations forward to the oversight in August of 2022 for, for your approval. Pause for a moment. I'll move now to my second topic, which is the proposed product development research RFAs for both cycles in 2022. This will be for cycle one and for cycle two. We are seeking the oversight committee's approval to launch all three again of our standard R, um, RFAs, Texco, RELCO, and SEED for both cycles in physical 2022. Um, you will find a detailed uh, description of each one of those mechanisms in your meeting book, but I have here a slide that kind of outlines the highlights for each one of those mechanisms. Um, with that, I, I will pause for any questions on either of these um, updates. Are there any questions for Dr. Walker Peach? Have you finished your presentation, Cindy? I have. I think you need to vote, though, to... Um, right. We are, we're, well, I'll go to the next, but I apparently Thank cut you. off Dr. Wilson, so I want to double check. Dr. Walker-Peach has presented the proposed timelines and product development program RFAs. CPRT will release for FY 2022. I will entertain a motion approving the proposed timeline and product development program RFAs for the first cycle of 2022, for FY 2022, as presented by Dr. Walker-Peach. So moved. Or second? Second. All in favor, vote aye. 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 Any, any opposed? Motion carries. Okay, we'll go back to Dr. Wilson's. My apologies. Oh, no worries. And thank you, um, Kristen. Uh, if we could go to the uh, fourth slide of that deck. Thanks. Uh, that's good. Uh, basically, this is information. Um, on previously um, uh, discussed RFA status. Um, tomorrow, the uh, Scientific Review Council panel will uh, review research training award responders. Um, this is a, a renewal of, um, of a longstanding RFA. And uh, Kristen mentioned some of the uh, annual report uh, discussion of its impact. Uh, basically, this training award supports pre- and postdoctoral trainees, uh, an important undergraduate summer internship programs, and some other um, specifically targeted training opportunities. Um, 
we had 15 applications to review, nine are renewals and six are new applications. You'll see the um, PIC recommendations based on this review in May. Um, we just closed submission of uh, applications in response to the uh, RFAs for the second cycle of this fiscal year. Uh, we received 159 applications. Um, recall that these are for the core facility support awards, um, early clinical investigator award and high impact, high risk awards. Those are familiar to you. Um, in addition, the new RFAs that are being competed this uh, cycle include the clinical trials network award, the Texas Clinical Trials Participation Program Award and the Texas Regional Excellence in Cancer Award. Um, the review of these applications will take place in May and we'll bring to you um, the PIC recommendations at the August meeting. And then finally, um, the remind you that last uh, Oversight Committee, you approved RFAs for the first cycle of FY2020. 2022. Um, these are the individual investigator research awards. Um, notable and with some real excitement, the two presentations by both the prevention program and the um, product development program this morning nicely demonstrated how CPERT over the past decade has begun to integrate discovery into these high impact areas. And um, I, again, these are really the pillar of the research programs uh, initiatives going forward for individual uh, investigator research awards in um, areas specific for addressing priorities such as computational systems biology, childhood and adolescent cancer, uh, prevention and early detection, and the clinical translation uh, into through clinical trials. Um, these are open for applications and will be um, reviewed next fall. And you'll see the final um, pick recommendations uh, at this meeting a year from now. Thank you, uh, Mr. Margo. Thank you, Dr. Wilson. Again, my apologies for interrupting uh, the presentation. Uh, I'm sure Mr. Montgomery will look for a public opportunity to chastise me. Uh, but. Uh, we appreciate it. Thank you very much. Is there, uh, there are no more actions to be taken, correct? Mrs. Doyle? That's correct. All right. Okay. All right. Then let's move to uh, the chair recognizes Mr. Graves to present the secrets internal audit report. I'll give him a second, but it is possible that he may be having connection problems. Um, he was one of them that let us know ahead of time that his power was going in and out. And, and Kristen, oh, okay. I have tried to contact him as well to see if his connection, he's appearing on, but he's not been able to respond to me either. Okay. Uh, Alyssa, do you want to go ahead and, and give the presentation? I can. I, I was just hesitating to make sure that he is not able. Um, but yes, not, not to delay any further, I'm happy to present the internal audit report that is in section eight of your materials. Um, our, present, our responsibilities as secret internal auditor is to present to the oversight committee the internal audit plan for the FY21 year. And um, we have three internal audit audits on the plan for this year. Um, the first of which is a review of the, the Sunset Self-Assessment Advisory. Um, of course, Secret will be going through, self through Sunset this year. Um, the Secret staff and, and management will, will prepare a self-advisory report and that self-assessment will be um, reviewed by internal audit and in collaboration with management. We will take the um, risk assessment that was performed for internal audit and align that uh, with the sunset review items. Planning is started on that internal audit and we would expect to perform that work here in the next, um, next month or so. Following that audit, 
in February and March, we will be performing an IT audit over IT general computer controls. It's been many years since the IT general computer controls have been looked at, um, but of course we've looked at, at information security previously. Um, and then the last item on our internal audit plan is an advisory consultation um, where internal audit will work with CPRIT on their records management and grantee compliance records um, as they migrate those records in to be full in-house in fully. Um, and so those are the three internal audit activities um, on our plan. Every year we also perform follow-up procedures on prior internal audit findings. Um, and there are four um, area topics that we'll be evaluating this year. We will be performing follow-up procedures on prior um, activities of the information security audit. In addition, there are um, three findings open on the communications audit that we will be performing follow-up procedures in May, and then um, one for the governance audit completed this year. We will also provide perform internal audit follow-up procedures in May. In June, we will commence a, um, a, a review of our advisory recommendations on the disaster recovery and business continuity planning. Um, that's really just a collaboration to um, continue to work on the advisory activities that were, um, were completed in the FY20 year. So that communicates the full extent of our internal audit plan for this year. Um, in addition, we have on page 8-3 the um, overall review of the, the internal audit activities since 2015. Um, there appears to be only four open items um, that, of course, are part of our follow-up procedures. And I'll entertain any questions. Any questions for Ms. Martin? Very quickly, Ms. Martin, just uh, on the on the chart that you've given us yes. listing everything has happened since 2015. The last line is 2018 communications follow up. What are the that had that line has more numbers on it than any other. What are the what are the items for communications follow up? Yes. Yeah, so um, this year we were unable to perform the uh, follow up procedures on that audit. Um, there's only three open findings. One was high and two are moderate. Um, the nature of those findings, I don't have off the, uh, at hand right now, um, but that particular audit, the, the, the follow-up procedures in the 20 year weren't unable to be performed. It just so did, right. Okay, you just yeah. couldn't get to it this year. Okay, it, thank you. Right. Yeah. Craig? You're muted. This question's really uh, uh, sort of for Wayne. Uh, Wayne, you sent around a uh, email about a state audit. Is there any update on the uh, state audit? Yeah, and I think uh, Heidi may be planning to give greater detail on it, but uh, they are still uh, doing the initial uh, fact finding for it. Um, uh, I don't expect we are going to hear anything for a couple of months, but uh, before I get too far out in front of Heidi, I'd rather have her talk about the, the specific time frame for it. Okay, are there any other questions for Ms. Martin? Thank you. Thank you. Turning to agenda item 12, the chair recognizes Mr. Roberts to present his three appointments to the Scientific Research and Prevention Program Committees. Thank you, sorry, sorry for that. Um, once again, uh, as normally happens at this time in our meeting, I have provisionally appointed three experts to CPERT's academic research and product development research committees. Our state statute requires your approval uh, for these appointments. Uh, the nomination subcommittee uh, met and recommends the appointments um, and uh, recommends the appointments for your approval. Uh, both of the affected program subcommittees reviewed uh, the nominations as well. And with that, um, Mr. Uh, Margo, I request your approval. 
there any questions for Mr. Roberts or the nomination subcommittee? So moved. Well, let me ask, is there a motion to approve the CEO's three appointments to the Scientific Research and Prevention Program Committees? Who so made the motion? Second. Okay. All in favor, vote aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. The chair rec now recognizes Ms. Eckel to discuss the proposed administrative rule changes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good morning, everyone. To the rules are located behind tab 10 of your meeting books, and we have both rules for final adoption as well as new proposed rules. Uh, I'll start with the final adoption. These were initially presented at the November Oversight Committee meeting, um, changes to chapter 703. The uh, amendments were published in the December 4th edition of the Texas Register for Public Comment, and we did not receive any public comments. So they're presented for final adoption um, as they were initially proposed um, in November. And unless there are any questions about the final order, I will move on to the proposed changes, um, which impact chapters 702 and 703. The first change is to section 702.19b. And this change provides a narrow exception to the general uh, prohibition of communication between a grant applicant and a peer reviewer. Uh, this exception would allow a peer reviewer who is assigned by the chairperson of the Product Development Review Council, or PDRC, uh, to participate in the due diligence and intellectual property and business operations due diligence interview stage of review. And this, this would allow uh, just to make sure that the, the full PDRC has all the information that they need um, when reviewing their grant, when reviewing grant applications after due diligence review. And all grant applications that reached due diligence review would be undergoing the same process. So each would um, have a peer reviewer assigned during that in intellectual property and business operations due diligence review. The second proposed rule change is in section 703.10. And this is related to uh, when a grant recipient uh, acknowledges secrets in publications. Um, we're requiring that they include the uh, grant ID numbers in those publications. Grantees are already required to acknowledge secret and this would just add to that that they include the grant ID number. And those are the two proposed rule changes. Um, we will send these to be published in the Texas Register if the Oversight Committee approves the changes and we would bring them back with any public comments at the May Oversight Committee meeting. Members, um, any questions for Ms. Eckel? No questions. I'd just like to point out that I did check all the citations here and Ms. Eckel, they were perfect. I knew you would. That's why I didn't even bother. Right. Oh, good. Performing his oversight committee responsibilities. Uh, members, is there a motion to approve the final order adopting the rule changes to the Texas Administrative Code Chapter 703 and to approve the publication of the proposed changes to Chapter 702 and 703 in the Texas Register? So moved. Second. All in favor, vote aye. 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 Any opposed? Chair Rao recognizes Ms. McConnell to present the Chief Operating Officer's report. Uh, good morning. Um, I won't go into the, all the details of my report since you've had it and I think it's fairly standard. Um, I will highlight the last item on the uh, memo that I uh, that's in your packet under tab 11. Um, and it just reiterates what um, Mr. Roberts presented earlier in a CEO report about the um, uh, statewide cost allocation plan 
age, uh, share um, that Seaport was built for um, in early January. Um, and just point out that um, we are waiting on the, the information back from the governor's office about <clears throat> how their, um, the, the consulting firm determined um, you know, the, the charges that went up 552% to almost $450,000. Um, but to provide you with the opportunity, um, because it does require that uh, Mr. Roberts uh, request uh, the transfer from um, the Legislative Budget Board to support that in our budget and be able to pay that bill this year, um, that, you know, to give you the opportunity to um, disapprove that if that is, um, you know, you don't feel that's a good use of our, our money. Um, but uh, unfortunately, that is due uh, most likely to the controller's office in the state treasury. Um, so without that, uh, then I'll finally um, respond to Dr. Rosenfeld's earlier question about the status of the state auditor's report or state auditors um, audit of secret grant management processes. Um, the auditors are still in the planning stage um, and we're waiting on them. We've been working with them. Um, they basically interviewed um, every member of senior staff and several members of the rest of secret staff about the various processes that we have to support the grants management um, uh, uh, procedures that we have. Um, as well as with um, our vendor GDIT for the services that they uh, provide to us um, for those procedures. Um, and so we are waiting for the state auditor once they conclude that round of interviews um, and kind of fact gathering um, to provide us with a scope and then we'll proceed to the next stage uh, which will be um, the actual field work where they will ask for samples um, and other documents um, to, you know, the, for them to review um, and look at how we are actually implementing their procedures. Um, the best I can give you is that they have told us they anticipate kind of concluding the audit and providing us with their findings um, or other recommendations roughly around the end of May, beginning of June, um, with a report uh, that will be issued sometime roughly around July. Um, so that's the most information I have on that. Are there any questions? Any questions for Ms. McConnell? Uh, Craig, go ahead. Just a quick one. Has, the, um, uh, has there been any indication of what's specifically being audited? Are there any specific concerns or is this just all routine? Um, it's all routine. Um, I will say they were, they have been working off of the 2013 audit. So they use that as their basis um, to kind of ask and inquire and which was difficult for us because so many of the procedures and processes that we, and even our law changed as a result of that audit, that some of the questions, you know, we've had to kind of tell them it, it doesn't work that way anymore. You know, we don't do any of that. Even the law doesn't support those original processes. So it's been a lot of that kind of back and forth. Um, and I think they're finally getting a picture of how we do business now. Um, but, you know, that's the, that we'd have no indication of anything else from them as of yet. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Rice and I were interviewed by them as well, and I thought the questions were pretty perfunctory, and, and they uh, they were still in a learning curve, but I didn't hear anything of great concern at all. Um, any other questions for Ms. McConnell? Wayne, did you want to say anything? I'm fine, thank you. Okay. All right, moving on to the next agenda item, Ms. McConnell, will you explain the recommended contract approval? Yes, thank you. <clears throat> so under tab 12, you have the uh, memo recommending um, the search firm services with Spencer Stewart um, for an amount not to exceed $175,000. Um, I will say that the, uh, the staff uh, review committee um, 
did have three applica uh, three proposals that they reviewed and determined that the uh, response from Spencer Stewart um, was the best value to the agency, um, both for their experience in this area and for their ability to be able to attract um, and or find a candidate or candidates um, who would meet CBRIT's requirements for the chief scientific officer position, um, which is very highly specialized. Um, and, you know, we've had a, a Dr. Wilson is the third in line of some stellar um, CSOs that we've had, so we want to continue that tradition. Um, I will also note that, and it's pointed out in the memo, that Spencer Stewart has participated and been our vendor um, in all of our prior searches. Um, so we also have worked with them in the past. Um, and, uh, you know, so we have some uh, degree of comfort too with the kind of quality um, and the services that they can provide to us. Um, so with that, um, I will entertain any questions. Any questions? <clears throat> Mr. Montgomery? One, I think, I think Dr. Wilson came to us partly uh, through happenstance. I mean, it, I, I believe that the, the candidates we had all sort of dropped off and Dr. Wilson said, well, you know, what about me? This prompts me to say, are we also alerting our own network of grantees and <clears throat> others that we know that we are looking so that we get the widest possible reach. In other words, we're not just saying, hey, Spencer Stewart, go find us some people. We are also telling or asking Spencer Stewart to tell our grantees or making sure that we are penetrating everywhere we should to look for someone. The answer to that is yes. Uh, and I've already talked to uh, one president of a uh, comprehensive designated cancer center. I intend to talk to uh, the others um, uh, in the next week or so, uh, uh, provide them. I, mean, I didn't want to get too far out in front of the search firm uh, because there are some issues that can only be addressed by the, by the search firm. Uh, but um, the, yes, we are, we, I, I, I am trying to, to cast a, a wide net in addition to Spencer Stewart's. Any other questions? Uh, Ms. McConnell? Yes. Ambrosio? Uh, yes. Um, Go ahead. The, the fee for 125000 that's all in, meaning including the, I just want to make sure, including the out-of-pocket expenses, that's separate. That, the out-of-pocket expenses are separate. And if they're separate, is there a maximum you, you guys allow or no? So the uh, that's a very good question. The, the out-of-pocket fees are separate. Um, but in order for them to bill those to us, um, they, we, they have to receive request and receive pre-approval in writing for the specific expenses that they want to bill. So we will not, um, you know, do any, pay anything that we don't specifically know what the outcome is. And most likely the major out-of-pocket expenses um, for travel, you know, in the, under these conditions, um, we don't anticipate actually having any. Um, okay, thank you. Okay, members, is there a motion to approve the search firm contract? So moved. So moved. Second. All in favor, vote aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, motion carries. Mr. Cutron, will you update on us on CPRIT's communications activities? Yes, uh, oversight committee members, good morning. My name is Chris Cutron, senior communications specialist for CPRIT. You'll find my communications update on tab 13.1 with a compilation of news clip highlights on tab 13.4. To summarize some of our news highlights, you'll see that Innovation Map, a Houston-based online publication, is where we see increasing coverage of our grantees, especially in the biotech field. Also in uh, January, Texas Tech University Health Sciences Center in Amarillo received some extensive television coverage on all local outlets. This was for the core facility award for the new state of the art imaging equipment at the Jerry Hodge School of Medicine. And I've included an example in the clips. Moving on to uh, outreach activities on December 8th, 2020, communications assisted Brazos Valley Economic Development Corporation 
for a webinar event about secret funding opportunities. The participants included research grantees and stakeholders from the AM system, as well as Fujifilm Diasynth. Dr. Wilson and Dr. Walker Peach also participated. If you haven't had a chance to view a recording of the event, I've included a link of it in my report. We hope to continue this type of outreach to economic development corporations in the future. On to social media, we are currently showcasing the 2020 annual report, running a post a day on our channels for most of the month of February. Some of these posts are being tied to February being the National Cancer Prevention Month. Also World Cancer Day on February 4th, uh, saw some great engagement uh, with our posts about secrets recognition as a gold standard health champion. Many of our grantee institutions also did social media and tagged us on World Cancer Day. Uh, January was Cervical Cancer Awareness Month, and we produced a video for social media featuring our guest today, Dr. Berenson, discussing cervical cancer and HPV prevention. I've included in your report a link uh, to the video on our YouTube page, and the video is also posted on our new annual uh, report. So that is my uh, communications update for this uh, quarter, and I'm happy to take any questions. Any, any questions for Mr. Catrone? Thank you. Thank you. We will, not, we will not take up standing agenda items 17, 18, or 19. The next regular oversight committee meeting will convene on May 19th, 2021. Seepert expects to hold the meeting by video conference. If there is no further business and no objection, the chair moves to adjourn this meeting. Is there a second? Second. Well, I do have to say that my package arrived, but it did not contain any chocolate chip cookies. Actually, there's <laughs> supposed to be oatmeal with butterscotch morsels, and I miss those as well, frankly. Yeah. Well, it, that never happened when I was chairman. I'm just saying. Yeah. Well, <laughs> okay. All right. They're taking advantage. Send a motion to adjourn. They're taking advantage of me out here in El Paso. They just take advantage of it. You know, we're used to <laughs> separate time zones, everything else. You know, it's, it's my cross to bear. Um, if there are no further business, no objections, chair moves to adjourn this meeting. Is there a second? Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you all. Motion carries. Thank, thank, thank you, you, members. Thank you.